Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. This two henchmen fell down on him. <laughs> Not yet. In 1923, I was in real estate business in Los Angeles. And I had a picture on my desk of an old man with a white beard down about to his navel. And the caption was, I'm an old man, and I've had many troubles, <clears throat> most of which never happened. I like that real, real good. This is we decided yesterday to be a question period. And uh, Chuck Boyd has the first question. one in every crowd. <laughs> decisions, decisions, decisions. I don't know. Jeff, we'll think about it. I don't know whether it'll be too quick to do it again next year or not. You got to change a little between them, you know. And I don't know whether we can grow very much in a year. We're not as green as we used to be. It's been 12 years since the last one. And I think it's just about right. <laughs> 12 years. <laughs> but I think about it, I think it's nice of somebody to think that they might want it. So I thank you for that. What's the next question? Should we work with it? practicing alcoholics before we have taken all the steps ourselves. I think that the very moment that a guy decides he wants what we have and becomes willing to go to any length to get it, he is ready to work with alcoholics. Not that he tries to carry the message to alcoholics, but that he tries to carry the alcoholic to the message. As soon as we have decided that we want what's here, we can tell anybody, look, I found a place that seems to manufacture sobriety. A bunch of guys that are doing something about the drink. And they have impressed me very much. And I'm going to meet them. How about going with them? So you carry the alcoholic's message. The book, he says, obviously we can't transmit something we don't have. That's what you're referring to. But you don't have to, uh, you don't have to be anything but kind to carry a message. Really, that's all. A little love. Okay. In our sobriety, how do we deal with emotions? A. Others we work with in the program. B. In our own sobriety. I got into that, I guess. I said sobriety was fourfold. Physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. 
emotional, but just be one of the areas of our life that has to become still. For instance, we're learning to work with alcoholics. We can't afford to become emotionally involved in their program. Or in their problem, I mean, not in their program, in their problem. We can't afford to become emotionally involved in the problem, or we lose all of our possibility for help. <clears throat> you got to stay above the problem. Now, it seems like maybe that that would be a a sort of a cold attitude. It is not. You have to love more to stay emotionally involved, yeah, uninvolved in the problem than you do to become involved in it. The answer is not in the problem. The answer is in the answer. I worked on my problem for 10 years. And the more I looked at the problem and the harder I worked on the problem, the greater the problem became. It was just like fertilizing and watering and cultivating the weed. It grew out of all proportions. And I think we have to be able to live above the problem to be of value to those who had it. We don't get emotionally involved in the problem. It's not that we love less, it's that we love more. I think it takes much more love to release than it does to hold on to. Emotional stability comes, I am sure, out of this thing we call self-discovery. Physical sobriety comes from not drinking. We don't drink today. And after a while, we are physically free from the effects of alcohol. But until we become emotionally stable, mentally stable, and spiritually somewhat stable, uh, we are, we're not sober. Sobriety is the ability to live comfortably, peacefully, and joyously with oneself. I find much, much confusion in this area of becoming emotionally involved in uh, the problems of our so-called babies. Many people think you got to be emotionally involved. In <coughs> and I think we completely stymie ourselves when we do that. What about sex after sobriety? Is there anybody here that wants to cover this? <laughs> includes possession, but not the necessity to possess. I think that uh, 
historically possible to live very happily in a marriage relation without uh, uh, emphasis on that particular deal. I know it's quite important to many, many people. It's strange how important that it gets at times and uh, then uh, in a little while how unimportant it is. <laughs> <laughs> We used to call it the biggest nuts there is, you know. But I, I, I realize that this is a problem in many, many families. It might be in mine. I don't know. But I believe that sex as such should be just as spontaneous as everything else. I think it should come as the result of love. You know, the giddiness of self to self in love. And I think that's the only way it has any value at all. I think that we as a sex are very, very lacking in this area. Actually, I do. All men. Because we are inclined to want what we want when we want it. And, uh, it's to explode. And that's what uh, happens. And when the explosion's over, they, 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 the job's done. As far as we're concerned. But I feel that that's totally selfish approach. I think that the love and adoration, both before and after the act, is far, far superior than to the act itself. In other words, I find nothing wrong with sexual intercourse as a result of love, but as a an objective, I think it's self robbery again. It's a beautiful thing when it's the givingness of self to self and love. And otherwise I find no value in it. That's all I can say. What is the value of patience when conflict with another alcoholic? We had all the alcoholics in the world in this room. Right now, we would have 90% of the patients of the human race. We are a very impatient lot. We want everything to happen yesterday. And patience is certainly a virtue. I doubt very much if uh, our value as a counselor would equal our value as a listener. If you can get the guy talking to the gal, you can get them talking. In my own case, if I'm talking to somebody new, the one thing that I listen for is the first attempt of the belly laugh. This ain't no big deal. You can't get serious. An alcoholic cannot take a preachment or a lecture. We know all about the preachment and the lecture. We've given them to ourselves a thousand times. We know exactly what they're going to say before they say it. And so, the sharing and the giving.
legitimate talk and be a good listener gives the counselor more value than talking to himself. We're not experts on anything. <clears throat> and it's the simple little thing that opens the door. It isn't the profundity. Nobody ever got sober on profundity. Nobody. Little thing. I mean, have you heard me tell this? But I was talking at this Bob White group many years ago on Santa Barbara and Van Eck. And there was a drunk in bad shape sitting right about there where the castle is sitting. And uh came time for him to light a cigarette. And he couldn't he couldn't do it. He couldn't get the thing to make. And he struggled and he struggled and uh after a while a little old lady that was sitting next to him reached over and took his cigarette and his match and lit it and put it in his mouth. And the next year, I was there at the same time. And this guy got his birthday, first birthday. And I thought, well, I must have done pretty well, you know, on that talk. <laughs> so I was prepared to get a nice compliment to him when he got out to take his birthday cake. And he said the reason he was back was not what was said or done in the meeting. It was the fact that this little old lady had made a cigarette for him. They don't depend on profundity. Expertise is love. And love is patience. Love is patient. That everyone that I love to think about. This happened to the Hopper group. I dealt there on Friday before Christmas every year. And ten or a dozen years ago, there was a guy sitting along the wall. There were benches along the wall. And he was leaping. He wasn't shaking. He was leaping. <laughs> And I went over and sat down beside him before the meeting started. And I put my arm around the guy. And I said, Sunday ain't no big deal. If you don't drink, if you don't take that next drink, three days you'll be pretty nearly well. Physically. Just put it off. Don't take that next drink. It ain't no big deal. Make a game out of it. You go for three days. Without a drink. See what happens to you. And for years, he's gone by me, or oh, uh, at least once a year in some meeting. And he gets right up to my left ear and he says, Son, it ain't no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes on about his business. So, yes. If you love him, you're patient. Next. How do we surrender and turn our will to God when after asking for guidance, we still ponder at times? There are many times when even prayer is like praying up a chimney. No way can you seem to make any Conscious contact with anything. Everything's futile. You have no purchase at all up there on the end of that line. And that's what the book means when it says when everything else fails, get your wet drunk. Because you see, when we're feeling futile, we want something. We want something. And it isn't happening. And there's no way that you can want something when you're working with a wet drug. No way. 
You can't think about yourself when you're working with a wet drum. That's one place where you get all your attention and love to the thing you had. It is just simply to outmaneuver it. <laughs> it neither be the pukey or the pukor in that case. So we got to get ourselves off of our mind. Now I have a thing of my own. I can't solve a problem. No way I can solve a problem, and I haven't tried it much in these last 29 years because I'm expecting guidance and direction. But if I wake up to the fact that I'm all tied in a knot, working on something, and I'm just completely rigid almost, subconsciously, I've been messing with this thing and beating my brains out. And I recognize it. And this is my little deal, and it, uh, it works for me right along. I, as I said to you, I share everything with my own God, good, bad, and indifferent. And in this case, I say, look, Dad, I'm beating my brains out over this problem, and I don't know the answer. You do. And when you get re ready to give it to me, I'd certainly be glad to have it. Sure thing. And I dump it. And I never look at it again. I just dump it. That's it. And in a very short time, I find out that it either wasn't a problem in the first place, which is about 50% of the time, or I have the answer. It's the self-concern and the impatience that bring about this sort of an impact in our own lives and to get ourselves off our mind. There's nothing more highly recommended than to sit down with a wet drum. Does that do you any good? With equal himself, taking over a periodically, do I analyze and look for answers to money? You're a mess. <laughs> <laughs> If I were you, I'd just give up. I find uh, so many of our people, even in the grapevine, I find so many of them right about self-esteem. Building self-esteem. I hear people get up here and talk all the time about you have to learn to love yourself before you can love anybody else. And I am... Most grateful that that ain't the case. I never spent any time trying to build up self-esteem. I never spent any time trying to love me. I went to taking me with a large dowry. I hated my damn guts. And so... I got busy doing things this book suggests. And it wasn't trying to learn how to self-esteem me or to love me so I could love you. I don't, I, I don't think that's uh, the way it is at all. Francis says, For it is better to love than to be loved. It is better to understand than to be understood. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in forgiving that we're forgiven. And it is in dying to self that we awaken to eternal life. And that's exactly what we've been talking about ever since we've been done. It's exactly what we've been talking about. I don't believe that an image I don't believe that an image of me would add anything to my life at all. I haven't any more image of me than I have of a walrus. That isn't what I'm interested in. 
I'm not interested in the image of me. That's not why I'm here. I'm here to share me with anybody that wants me in love. And let the chips fall where they may. I'm not even interested in your opinion of what's happened. Except when you want to give it to me. That's not my deal. I love you. I love you. And that's all I have to do. That's what I'm interested in. That's my deal. It's not my deal who you love or what you love. Or what you think. That's your deal. I love you, period. I don't even have to concern myself about what you think. That no image is all of me. I think of myself exactly as that big window up there in front of my chair. That window, to me, is me. And when there's no obstruction, the light comes through. But the window is not the light. And I think of that drape as my ego. And when that drape's closed, the light don't come through. But just as the window is not the light, the drape is not the darkness. It just shuts out the light. So my business is keep the drape open, Phil. And let the light shine. And I don't furnish the light. I'm a channel. I'm a channel. You and I are necessary to God as channels through which he goes forth into his creation. We're channels. Then we get ourselves out of the way and let it be. And let it be. Now, as we said last night, and as I say to me all the time, I'm either going to run my life and take the consequences thereof, or I'm not going to let run and take the consequences thereof, and I can't run mine. And I don't get involved in running my life. I get involved in living. I think losing yourself in life guarantees finding yourself in God. Guarantees it. Because all you got to do is to get rid of the roadblock. You lose yourself in life to find yourself in God. And Phil, I wouldn't, if I were you, I wouldn't spend another five seconds trying to find self-worth or anything else. To find yourself, yes. To realize that whatever it is you're looking for is right here. What you're looking for, you're looking with. What you came here to get, you came with you. Everything you ever wanted to know, you've always known, and everything you've always wanted to be, you've always been. But it's covered up. It's covered up. So we uncover and discover. And get lost in that building. Forget about you. To hell with you. And you've got a little better break on that than I have. Maybe you have and maybe you ain't. Bill has got a little income. <laughs> so it allows him to uh, have a little more time on his hands than maybe he should have. <laughs> you know? You hear yourself? I think that's it. Forget about old Bill and just do, do, and let the chips fall away the next. The beautiful thing about this deal is not to get serious about yourself. To make a whole deal, a game. A play of life upon itself. And you have fun out of it. I have more fun with God than I do with you. I have a hell of a lot of fun with God. I think that the guy has a tremendous sense of humor. Or he wouldn't have hit himself in the last place we ever looked. You know. I think it's pretty. Very last place we ever looked. There he is. I can just see him, you know. <laughs> Here I am, I'm trying to find the bottle. 
half hour, you know, and I've got to have a drink. You <laughs> better look that son of a bitch. Not me, I'm with him. <laughs> 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 oh, I love it. <laughs> it's a fun deal. You're too serious, Phil. Yes. Make it, make a fun deal out of it. Huh? That help any? Oh. Should members of AE work professionally in the field of alcoholism? <laughs> <laughs> Will some of you counselors answer that one? I do not really uh, care much to comment on it, but I would say this. It's awfully hard. It's awfully hard for amateurs like us to get mixed up with professionals and stay amateurs. We're strange bunch. All we have to do is to rub elbows a little while with a doctor, and we become doctors. <laughs> Maybe some people can retain their amateur standing in working for money in the field of alcoholism. I don't know, maybe you can. But in my personal life, I've met only one that seemed to do it, and he wasn't around long enough to really uh, see whether it was going to work out or not. And that was Warren Snyder. Warren died about a year or so after, two years after he started uh, working in the field of alcoholism for money. Now, the one thing that would seem to be furthest from a paid 12-step call would be working with the National Committee on Alcoholism. Because the National Committee on Alcoholism has no recovery program at all. They are educational and referral. That's their business, and that's not the business we're in. So it would appear that there would be no conflict to work for the National Committee on Alcoholism. Because they, they, they have no, no, uh, program of recovery. But those of my friends who work with them somehow become special. I'm mindful of one gal I love very, very much. And ten years ago, she made one of the finest say talks I ever heard in my life. And she became an employee, secretary, committee on alcoholism, and she talked about a group a year ago, I guess. And she made her just as fine a talk as she ever made. But it wasn't Alcoholics Anonymous talk. It was a professional talk. It was a professional talk. And the one thing about us that we must maintain is caring and sharing. We're not experts on anything. We share our experience, think, and hope. One with another in love. And so I haven't seen anybody even be able to do that kind of thing without seeming to get lost in infection. infection. Incidentally, it wasn't three months after that talk that she was in the hospital herself. Not I'm sure for either pill drinking, I say I'm sure, I'm not sure of anything. I'm like, Phil, I don't know nothing. <laughs> but she was in the hospital for a sort of a breakdown of some kind. I can't do it. Personally, 
when I talk for organizations that have an honorarium. The, the thing I do carries an honorarium for, say, 75 to $150. I don't take. I don't take. Because why well, they don't know it, I'm going to play this. I learned what I'm telling them from you guys. From drunks who don't drink. And I can't any more take an honor in than I can fly. Because you guys didn't charge me a thing. You didn't even ask me if I had anything. The only thing you said to me is, Mister, were you looking for somebody? And I said, No, sir. And he says, Well, what were you looking for? And I said, If it was interesting, sir, I was looking for sobriety. And you lit up like a Christmas tree. Took me and rocked me to sleep. Now I'm certain that any alcoholic is totally. Free to make a living. I think we're entitled to make a living. But if I were a creature, excuse me, Dave. <laughs> if I were a preacher, I would want my business on the side. Because I would not want to get up here. And try to tell you monkeys what you want to hear. I would not want my gas and water in your hands. If you don't like me, you cut off my gas and water. So I've got to try to please you. I can't do that. I would want my business on the side. I want my money coming in from here. So I can tell you what I think. I can't talk without saying it as I feel it, as I think that it should be. And I can't work in that field. But if I were a captain in the Marines, and they wanted me to head up the program of alcoholism for the Marines, and I could set up my own staff, as certain Marines have had the privilege to do it, I might do what a captain in the Marines who asked that question did. He came to me and he said, what am I going to do? I said, get your staff to handle the related disorders. Get all these people that you have working with you to handle the hotheads, the pillheads, the sex maniacs like, uh, who was that? <laughs> and you deal in Alcoholics Anonymous. The, the drunk and Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's what you did. And it's worked out beautifully, and I don't see it's doing you any harm. Yes, Dave. Members of AA and Meetings of Al Anon, are we missing anything? Well, I think you are because most of them are women, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, my wife is is quite a nanny nanny nanny, and uh, I had a lot of fun with her. I got by for many years by saying to her when she got a little out of line, "Look, sister, you had to be for us <laughs> because we belong to my program, you know." And after a while, she got. Smarty pants. And she starts saying we wouldn't need a program if that was <laughs> you. Now I don't 
see why I should go anyplace else or have to go anyplace else to find out how to work my program in alcohol economy. As far as I'm concerned, I don't see where you do Long before alcohol is non uh, before Alanon was born. When people were coming to me and saying, you got to get this guy sober, or this gal sober. I was saying to them, maybe, maybe, this is the best time in your life to find yourself. Maybe the only chance you've got to help this alky is not to come to me, but to apply these principles to yourself. Find your own peace. And maintain your own peace in your own household. And it might be the, the only good thing you can do for that drunk. This is a long time before I'm not born. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to find living answers in our program, which we must find along with sobriety. And I don't mind going to Alan Unleaded. That talk before Alan Unleaded is pretty easy. Matter of fact, you people don't know it. But you're looking at the greatest Alan Unleaded speaker there is. <laughs> <laughs> Two years ago, a Swede from Dallas called me. Old in Lancaster, I guess that's Swedish or something. And it was Thursday. And only until Chuck when he went to New for Dallas. I said, I'm not coming. Oh, she's just sure. He says, I'm not coming to Dallas. He says, I asked him when you leave. And I said, I'm not coming. And he says, I, I don't want that kind of an answer. Why are you leaving? And I says, who fell down on you? What's the matter with the speaker you had? Why didn't you ask me first? <laughs> Who ran out on you? He said, son of your goddamn bitches. <laughs> well, to make a long story short, I flew to Dallas and talked at the Island on Munchen. And I was a substitute for a substitute. <laughs> the first one that had agreed to talk to the Al Anon lunch luncheon was the late Liz. You know, the gal in the, who wrote the book, the late Liz. What was her name? Gert, Gert, Gert Bahana. Gertie and I don't get along too well anyway. But she was the gal that, uh, was supposed to talk, and she pooped out, and the next one was uh, Adler Rogers said John, and she pooped out. So I'm a substitute for two broads, substitute for a substitute. And they still say down there that I gave the best I don't talk to them. <laughs> so, <laughs> I just used that to make it uh, hard. Now there's no there's no reason you shouldn't go to Al Anon meeting before. Next, how do you prove love? Why well, I don't think that you prove anything. I don't think we've got anything to prove. Nothing to win, and we're not going any place. I have to tell you again. I said this in this meeting already. But I'll spell it again because I love it myself. This certain doctor called me at midnight. <laughs> and he says, what's your definition of love? I said, it's the same as this 10 o'clock in the morning. But then he called me at midnight and asked me what the definition of love is. He says, what's your definition of love? I said, you won't like it. He says, what is it? I said, action. Talk about love is like talking about humility. I feel very humble this morning, boys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. 
<laughs> Action. If you love somebody or something, you do something for them. You just do it. And you don't make a big deal out of it. You don't make a big deal out of it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend five seconds trying to prove anything that I said from this podium for, to anybody here. That's not why I'm here. To prove something. I'm going to spend five seconds trying to, trying to defend anything I've said. I have, a, I have a right to my own opinion, and you have a right to yours. And you have my approval. If you want to disagree with everything I've said, and the way I've said it, then you get all right with me. And the same thing is true with people everywhere. I love you. It's none of my business what you think of me, unless you want to make it so. So quit trying to make something out of it. Prove it. Next. Upon waking with negative thoughts, how does one establish a relationship with God? I think this is what we've been talking about all weekend. Praying without ceasing. I find no difference in the prayer and the serious thought. It's the same thing. As we said, uh, since we've been here, <clears throat> fear, worry, is a prayer for something you don't want to happen. To live in the conscious awareness of the living presence of God. <clears throat> I don't even like too much. I talk about it an awful lot with the Our Father prayer. Our Father God. I talk about Our Father lots. But this relationship that we've been talking about this weekend is much, much closer than a father-son relationship. As I said, I believe, I said, I've got two sons someplace in Southern California. I don't know where he's one of them are. This is impossible. With my relationship with my own God. Because God is that which I am. God is that which I am. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't be. There would be nothing. I would be extinct but for God. Because God is life. And there's no way to be separated from God. In reality, the only separation there is, is conscious. The feeling of conscious separation from, let's see. Very real as an experience, but not reality. So, I don't think that we ought to wake up feeling any difference than we want to sleep. Or feeling that it's any different than 10 minutes after we get up. Now is the deal. How is it with me right now? How is it with me right now? Now, if I had to get up and start praying right quick to feel good, I don't think I'd feel good when I get through praying. <laughs> I think I ought to feel good when I go and start praying. And again, my prayers, I don't know when they start to stop. You like that launch a little in that deal. Because I like to live in the conscious awareness of the living presence of God. In a relationship with everything around me. Everything around me. So I, I I think that's the thing to, to sort of get to your head. That now is the time. You see, this is this is so very vital to me because she, tomorrow was always the day I was going to straighten up and fly right. 
tomorrow. I was going to do it, you know. But tomorrow I never got here. Every time I came to, it was now, and I was thirsty. <laughs> so I took a drink. Tomorrow I never got here, and I go again. I don't think I have to be in any particular position to uh, retain this feeling of the living presence. Right. I don't think that it uh, happened in a church or in the mountain or in the temple or in Jerusalem. It's in my own mouth that I might know it and do it. So that's the only answer I'd have to that. Yes. When did you really start trusting God all the way? I don't know. I don't know, because I discovered that it had happened, you see. I think it happened when this thing was burned out. The first time. I think that's what had happened because I was in here and this was me all the time. You know. But to be born out of conscious separation and conscious unity makes it a reality. A belief in God is good, but it is not good enough for alcoholics. We have to live in God. To live in God. That's what this whole thing is all about. To get us out of our own way. So that we can go about our father's business. That's the only business I've had for 29 years. I'm in a business. I go about my father's business. And that's my business and his business take care of. And it's just as natural and normal as breathing. I expect it. Not that I'm sitting around in expectancy and waiting for somebody to pick up the phone or to ring it. It's just my being. I know that every good and perfect gift is from there. Father Barney said to me, ten years ago, we were driving under the Dragon Hill Freeway. I was taking him home with me. We've been jogging. And just as we went under the freeway, he said to me, Chuck, how in the hell do you fulfill your commitments? I said, what are you talking about? He says, you've got three lives. And any one of them is enough for anybody. And you do all three of them. How do you do it? And I said, Father, you ought to know that better than I do. You're going to Jenny. You can study all your life. Why do you ask me that question? He says, why, how do you do it? And I said, there's no division in my life. There's no division in my life. When we practice these principles in all of our affairs, gentlemen, there is no division in life. There is nothing that is more or less important, and there's nothing that is more or less spiritual than another. Your business is just as spiritual as your AA. Your AA is just as spiritual as your church. Your home is just as spiritual as both of them. Substance is just as spiritual as, uh, ha ha. <laughs> Joy. Just as spiritual. Every good and perfect gift is from his hand. And to live in this, to be a, a, aware of this. Constantly aware of it. And that's what I was going to ask. To trim the sails. To trim the sails. Some ships fly east and some fly west by the self same wind that blows. It is the set of the sail and not the gale that determines where it goes. And so, trimming the sail. Saying to myself maybe 50 times a day, God is my refuge and my strength. I don't know why I'd add that. I'm not afraid of nothing. I'm not afraid of you, I'm not afraid of God, I'm not afraid of the devil, I'm not afraid of tomorrow or yesterday. 
Why would I be sin? God is my refuge and my strength. Lift up your eyes into the hills from whence cometh thy street. I love the hills. I love God. And I came to say it, reminding myself that in him I live and move and have my being. The conscious awareness of the living presence of the Almighty. Now that's what this would teach all about. There's nothing else here. So far as I'm concerned, I'm either going to run my life and take the consequences thereof, or I'm not going to run it and take the consequences thereof. And those are not works. That's the way I live. And I cannot live any other way. I did it 43 years. And that was 43 years too long. <laughs> That do you any good? I've always been a competitor. How do I remove the competition from my life? It's strange thing to me again that I have been a competitor all my life. I was <coughs> correct this morning because he's a man who is soon as old as I am. Sure don't love it, but he had a very shepherd view. <laughs> 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 I could do anything with my body up until I got hurt in football. I could do anything. Football, basketball, baseball, and track. The whole business was just duck soup. Old Walter Cap said years ago, the only way I could keep from being an All-American was to get hurt. So I got hurt. Got removed from football. Competition was my life. I had a brother that was three and a half years old than I. And we were competitors. From the time I could walk until I left home at 20, we were in a fight. <coughs> Lasted 20 years on the installment plan. <laughs> and he was three and a half years older than I, and three and a half years stronger. And up until I was 18, 19, 20, he whipped me. But he couldn't make me believe it. He could not make me believe it. We started to fight his kids two miles from home. And every time he got off of me, I'd dog him. <laughs> and we ended up in the living room and mother whipped us both. And I left home at 20 thinking I could whip that guy. He never did make me believe that he could whip me. So competition, yes, it was my life. Now I do a lot of long bowling. And if I go down there to beat somebody, uh, I'm like a war woman. It's just like I never had a bowl in my hand. But if I go down there to, 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 do the best I can with what I got. And enjoy my competitor's shot just the same as my own. I didn't beat anybody in the place. 1957, I sang as champ in the Beverly Hills Lawn Bowling Club. And I only bowl twice a week. I bowl Saturday and Sunday. And all the rest of them bowl all day. And you know, uh, that's a delicate, delicate game. So I can't compete with anybody. And again, it is not because I decided not to compete. You see, I'm lucky. I'm lucky, lucky, lucky. Because I didn't want nothing when I came here. Not even surprised. I just wanted to rub out as much of the record as I could. And you can't rub out a record thinking, you know, in terms of competition. You can't do it. You just help people do things they need to have done because you want. And I had to do that to rub out. And when I finally woke up to the fact that things were going good, I was in a habit of it. And I just kept doing it. And I'm still doing it. And I believe this is the thing that... Uh, we're talking about. Oh.
our civilization has laid so many things on us that are totally extraneous. You have to be this and have that and be known as before you can live. You know? And the only thing you can do in life, gentlemen, is live it. Being here is the only thing that counts. The only this of the now is the only thing that counts in this life. Take no thought of the morrow. Let's just leave what's just going for long and already should be closed. The Heavenly Father knows what you have need up for yet. Now then, my son, it's so much more fun to get as much fun out of your opponent's shot as your own. It's so much more fun. It's twice as much. And if you had a force it's four times as much. You know? It's normal and natural that you wish you were uh, supposedly uh, your so-called competition well. Wish you well. They do their thing and you do yours. And there's no competition if you're doing it right. There's no competition. There's no feeling of competition in it. Now, just while I've got it on my mind, all you've got to do, everything that this thing about, is shifting the motivation in your life. That's all you've got to do. Shift your motivation from taking something from to giving something. To adding to. Even when you go to a, a meeting, and out on its own, shift your motivation from going to get to go into add to. From the time I discovered I was sober, six months after I got here, until right now, I have never gone to meetings get anything. And I can't be in a bad meeting. I can go to a meeting and disagree with everything that's done in it. The speaker and everything he says and the way he says it. And come out with a full cup. Because it always happens as you go open somebody just seeing you might get a lift, you know. It might do somebody good just to see you there. And maybe somebody will ask you a question that you can answer, that you can share. And you can't come away from that thing without a full cup. And it's just shifting your attitude from taking from to adding to and it did throughout your life, everything in your life. And it's not a do good attitude. God damn it, do I have stupid. <laughs> Monday. <laughs> it's not that you want to be, you know, to be a do gooder. You said that to, to be good for something is self operated even if it's good ahead. To be good for something is self operated Be good for nothing. That's the fun deal. Just to be good for nothing. How did I overcome this issue of it? Oh, my family and business associates that I should make plans for tomorrow and the future. Okay. If I supposed to quit at 11, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. I don't think I told you guys about having to walk off from a half million dollars in 1957. Did I tell you about that? I want to tell you this, because this is the answer to your question. When I was a year sober, I ran into Fish Property, which is the corner of Guardia and Normandy. It was owned by some very good friends of mine, Jackson Brothers, Brothers. Very good Mormons, if you'll pardon me, Dave. Did you hear the one? I'll tell you what they went about this, you know. The Pope got the College of Cardinals together. And he said, Boys, I just got a phone call, and I got some good news and the bad news. He says, Which do you want first? 
no sugar rod, and this is we'd like to good news for us. This is wrong. The phone call said that the second coming of Christ had already taken place. Christ is at this time. Walking the earth. They thought that was great. He says, now what's the bad news? He says, the telephone call came from Salt Lake City. <laughs> so, I knew this property was 10 acres on the corner down there, and I knew it was a tremendous buy, and I thought it was a good place for a market. In my early years in the market business, I got all of my business from promotions. I found who owned properties and talked to them about either leasing them or building the building or whatnot, you know. And if they wanted to do something, I'd get a tenant for it. And all that stuff, or I'd buy the property for them. And all that was just to go to fix it. I wasn't in the real estate business at that time at all. I was in the fixture business. Now, I knew values, and I was pretty well familiar with what would make a good market site and what wouldn't. And I liked this property, and I thought, ooh, I get to buy it. And it occurred to me that my boss might want it. Because his father had started the business, and he was a wealthy man before he took it over. 1908, his dad had started this thing. And he was very wealthy. And so, I went in one morning and I said, Victor, I found something that you might want. And he said, what is it? And I told him about it. And he listened. And he said, go buy it, Charlie. And I said, no. I said, I thought to you that I would go buy it. So I said, you like it? Go buy it. I said, no, Victor. Get in the car and we'll go down. We can go down and back in an hour. And so we did. And he looked at it. And he said, go back. I said, no. Let's find out if anybody else in town likes it. Let me bring a couple of market operators down here and see if they like it. See if they like to have that building on it. He says, Charlie, you like it. Go back. And I went back. And when I got to Westco, one night after everybody had gone to his secretary and myself, he called me in. The two of us were with me. And he said, Charlie, I didn't want that property. I don't want it. I don't need it. I want to get you in the same position I'm in. And as soon as I get you in the same position I'm in, we will retire together. Now I'm giving you 25% of this deal. 25% of this deal is yours. Now go out and get us a tenant and we'll build him a building and We'll go from there. Twenty-five percent is real good. And I went, and I got bonds to take a deal on. They didn't like it. But, said they, this is the first time I've ever had any uh, uh, chance to do anything with Charlie. <laughs> and he hadn't given us a bonds to do still yet on location. So, let's take it. It can't be that bad. It can't hurt us much. So they took the deal because of me. And they knew about my 25%, not only for me, but for Victor. <clears throat> and so, we built them a building. Jackson Brothers built it. And he built it for half a fee, 5% instead of two. Because I'd known them since they were <coughs> labor contractors, the two boys and their father and their uncle. Contracted labor for duplexes over there between Highland and La Brea and North Third Street and Hancock Park. And I was a duplex king. We worked together a lot. And we knew each other good. And so they wanted to do something for me too. And they built a building for our fee. We needed a loan. I went to Vernon Jenkins, who was chairman of the board of. Uh, after in life. And I called on his son. And he he got us over. And Vern thought the son rolls and set in me. And I went down to him. I says, Vern, we need a loan to build a building. He says, What do you want? He says, You got anything you got down here, including the company. 
Just tell me what you want and you got. And so, everybody in the deal knew all about it. And we built a building and bonds opened it and it was a bonanza. From the very beginning, it was a bonanza. We were getting from 17 to $2,100 a week rent. A week, gentlemen, rent. Because we had a percentage lease. And loud, it was just so good. 100, 125, 140,000 a week. We were doing volume in there. On a percentage lease. And everybody was very happy. And then I got Mary asked departments for us. And we built them a department store, and they went the same way, and everything was just beautiful. To make a long story short. Ten years later, in my eleventh year, Victor was going to retire, and I was going to retire with him. Now, all this time, we had talked about this thing, we talked about what I was doing. We had laughed and cried together, because we're just as one man. Up until the last year. And my eleventh year, it seemed like the guy was thrown away from me, but I just thought it was because he was tired. And he was, you know, he was, his mind was on something else. But I was retired, and I don't want to be talked about it, but me. And when it seemed time to do it, well, it's been the first, next thing is, I bought that house where I live now. Because it was going to Because my part of this year, this deal was worth 500000 bucks for this time. A minimum of 500000 And that was my security, you see. So I was going to retire. Now I had very, very good, uh, commendable motivation. I was going to retire and spend my whole time working with bums like you at my own expense. There's nothing wrong with that motivation, huh? So I bought that house and retired. And it came right down to the wire. And they couldn't do it. He could not do it. It was too much money. And he had to deny the whole thing. And uh, it was impossible. Because we had been just like that. We had laughed and cried for ten years. And we discussed this thing time and time again. We were going to retire again. And he couldn't do it. It was too much dough. And he had to deny the whole that thing. Now, I, I was naturally uh, destroyed. Because I could not believe that this man would do that. I couldn't believe that he could possibly do it. And my insight was you can't let him do this for his own benefit. You can't let him do this to himself. And my toenails in my hair and where I was right. And my insight says, this is for your family, your kids and your wife. This is their thing. You know. And it's just can't be, you know. And I talked to counsel, board counsel, legal counsel. And they said to me, Charlie, you can go the court and beat your hands down. You got every witness in town. Everybody in town knows about that thing. From him and from you. <coughs> so you can go and beat him. Like that. Then I considered taking him to court. But I couldn't take him to court. Why? Because in 1946, he came in to tell me through that window, but he didn't. He didn't tell me through that window. And I couldn't take him to court. And I couldn't judge him. I couldn't resent him. I couldn't hate him. Because if I did, he'd get drunk. And if I got drunk, I'd die. And here I am between a rock and a hard place, suffering the tortures of the damned, 
because I couldn't see through this damn thing, you know. It was just a reversal of everything that we built on for 10 years. Now it was interesting because his secretary had heard this thing too. And I would talk to her about it. And she heard things that she wanted to hear. But when she didn't want to hear anything, uh, even if she heard it, she didn't hear it. Because she had hearing problems. And she would tell me, uh, Charlie, I, uh, I didn't get it. I didn't hear it right. Well, now the reason she said that was because this guy's dad had set up a $30,000 uh, thing for her, and Victor had him paid it. And she had $35 coming. And she couldn't take that <laughs> just for that. <laughs> so she had to have me money, you know. And I uh, did the whole thing. It was very beautiful what I think it was. Because I had subconsciously come to believe this was my spirit. And it took me a whole year of the most excruciating pain. The only thing that was good about that pain period, except what came out of it, was that there wasn't one instant in the whole year that it ever occurred to me to take away. Now that's that's something. Because I suffered the touch of the day. But long towards the end of the year. I came to see that there's only one spirit. This is the answer to you put. There's only one spirit. That's my own relationship to my own God. There are no values out there. The values are here. There's evidence of value out there, but no value. The minute we put a value on a million bucks, we are tied loose around our necks. Because we're allowed to lose it. Just as that 500 grand, you know. So there's evidence of value out there, but the value is right here. Remember the man said, this is the last time I'm going to say this in this meeting. Excuse me, Paul. Where are you? <laughs> you got that. He had to run out because he's heard this story 14 times. <clears throat> the man said, lay up for yourself treasures. No, he says, uh, don't lay up for yourself treasures on earth. Where the rust corrupts and thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. The rust does not corrupt, and these don't break through and steal. Because where the treasure is, there will be the heart also. So I had to come and speak. That there's only one spirit, and that's the only relationship with my God. And when that happened, I called this in one night. Everybody was gone again. Take an eye. And I was victory. <coughs> I want to go through this deal with you once more. And I don't want you to let me make one mistake. If I say anything that isn't exactly as it happened, stop it. And we learn that out of shop talk. And I want you to do it step by step. And when I got through, I said, look, you didn't stop it. And this is no trouble, I didn't. And I said, is that exactly the way it happened? And he said, yes, it is. And I said, Victor, you take it. You need it. I don't need it. God bless you. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.